last session aimed, uh, the last session aimed at introducing the question of the European Union and its raw material conquest strategy, what role does trade policy play and how does it link to energy transition? Um, so very quick recap, what we did was we looked at the climate targets and the math is actually pretty easy. So what we see is that if, if the European Union wants to comply with its own climate targets, that is not uh, the Paris, uh, the same as the Paris uh, targets, the demand for raw materials is estimated to more than double until 2050. Uh, so that's a very short time for a lot of new raw materials. And the European Union at the moment does not have these quantities of raw materials in its own grounds, obviously. Uh, so that means that we have to get them from somewhere else. And although there's a variety of strategies to uh, secure access to these raw materials, the current trade policy plays a very important part in accessing them. Um, and this obviously has an extensive downsize for people um, and the planet in the extracting countries. We all know um, how mining is mostly pretty harmful to both environment and uh, human rights issues, indigenous rights, etc. Um, so doubling the demand for these raw materials in a very short time would mean extensive downsides for both people and the planet. And what, would, what we would actually need is to have a discussion and a serious discussion within Europe on how to degrow the amount of resources and um, the things produced and recycle what we really need. So that was a super quick recap from uh, what we did last week. Um, and now we will look at how does actually uh, trade and raw materials for the energy transition link with a focus on fossil fuels. Um, because on the one hand, um, as we talked about a lot last time, we need trade policies to get raw materials for the energy transition. However, um, trade policy also plays an important role in protecting the fossil fuels that are out there at the moment. Um, so how does this work? Um, the main instrument um, that there is in trade agreements is um, the so-called ISDS mechanism that is investor state dispute settlement. So that means um, that companies get special rights to sue countries over lost profits for their investment. Um, some of you might be familiar with that mechanism already. It's something that we've criticized a lot uh, during TTIP and CETA um, protest times, but it's a mechanism that a lot of uh, trade agreements actually have and that originated um, many decades ago, actually, and that was had maybe a little bit of, um, yeah, I made a little bit of sense uh, many, many years ago, but definitely does not make sense today anymore because countries can use uh, or companies can use the country's national way, legal ways. Um, nonetheless, the mechanism is there. It's there in a lot of trade agreements. Um, <clears throat> and in recent years, what we've seen is that countries, uh, when countries decide to do stricter climate policies, for example, when they want to exit nuclear energy or when to want to exit coal energy, um, the companies that already had invested in, for example, nuclear power plants or coal power plants sue the countries over the last profits because of that earlier exit. Um, we've seen such cases, for example, um, Vattenfall, a Swedish company, is suing Germany over the nuclear exit. Um, RWE is threatening to sue the Netherlands over um, coal energy exit. And one of the most um, outrageous ca cases maybe is Rock Hopper versus Italy, which is a case when Italy decided to do no more drilling for oil in the, Adria in the Adriatic Sea. And Rock Hopper sued them over investments they had already made looking for oil there. And they won huge amounts of money. That's actually a case that only got decided last summer. Um, so as you can see, or maybe imagine um, the effect that companies can sue states for a lot of um, public money for climate policies is actually quite outrageous. 
Um, and also, as you might imagine already, this is a mechanism that uh, officially does not only apply to the fossil industry, obviously. Um, however, what we see is that the fossil industry is the one using this mechanism most. So it's the company's decision if they want to use that or not. Um, and the fossil industry makes out about 20% of worldwide cases, which is a lot. Um, what we also see is that they are winning most of these cases. Um, and that the compensations they go for are bigger than in most of the other branches. So this is um, this is also to show a little bit the special role of the fossil industry. Um, on the other hand, so that that uh, does not get lost, we also see, for example, um, ISDS cases in Spain against changes in uh, the renewable energy sector. So it's also possible to sue over changes in that area, um, which is also a problem, obviously, because it limits the democratic space the governments have to um, influence the, the energy transition. Okay, um, a very quick, um, yeah, um, off topic maybe no not off topic obviously um but uh one of the treaties that mostly um is used for these um cases and these suits is the so-called energy charter treaty many of you might have heard about this already because it's one of the treaties that we have been campaigning against um the strongest over the last couple of years um that is a treaty that only um works in the topic of energy compared to most of the other treaties where it's about uh, trading all sorts of goods and um, the energy charter treaty is about investment in the energy system generally um, and 55 member states are a member of the energy charter treaty and most of the um, ISDS cases and the ISDS cases of fossil companies that we see today are actually based on the Energy Charter Treaty. Uh, why is this relevant? We are super close to getting many, many countries to exit the Energy Charter Treaty. Um, so the Energy Charter Treaty was supposed to be modernized um, and made compatible with the Paris Agreement that failed. Um, and now the European Union is trying to fight a collective exit, but um, it's actually hopefully looking very good that at least uh, this special treaty will no longer be based for ISDS claims. Um, so now what we want to look at today is actually not an uh, energy charter treaty case, but a bilateral uh, investments treaty case. And it still says that Aldo is going to give a presentation now, and that's uh, that's going to be Bettina, unfortunately, now. Or actually, I'm super happy about it, obviously. Um, and yes, that would be my moment to hand over to Bettina. We're looking forward to your input. Yes, thank you very much, Teresa. Thank you for this uh, presentation, <clears throat> which helps me actually a bit also with the one I'm going to give. I'm also very sad, Aldo is not here and to uh, tell you that he told me that like one hour ago. So I had already prepared part of the presentation as he had asked a bit, um, for a bit of help. So I will try to give my best, uh, maybe a quick, uh, why why can I even talk about this? Because I have been with TNI, as Teresa said, I have been doing quite some research already I actually have been working for more than six years already on ICS claims against Latin American countries. Um, with the TNI, we're publishing a, a general report every year on ICS claims against Latin American countries. And there's also special country reports. One is on Colombia. It is all in Spanish so far, but this year we aim to also have it in English. And I will later on um, uh, share the link to the website dedicated website with you in, in uh, on ISDS claims against Latin American countries. So um, yeah, maybe that as a little intro. And if you and and I have actually just recently updated the report on Colombia. So what you're now going to see is a bit on 
our research on ISDS in Colombia and its investment protection regime on the case of Lencor the third actually against Colombia. And um, then I will also quickly give a little insight on the EU Colombia FTA, actually EU Colombia Peru Ecuador FTA, which um, has been in, play, in force since 2013 and also had some impact on uh, minerals trade and um, not so much on coal, but yeah. Let me share my screen with you and see if that works. Is that the right one? I think so. Uh, okay. Can you see that? Okay, nobody's saying no, so I hope yes. Okay, yeah, Teresa's saying yes. Okay, wonderful. Then let's dive right into it. If you have any further question, please uh, write them in the chat already or go, uh, save them for after my presentation. So what uh, has been the impact on Colombia um, concerning its trade investment regime? Maybe it's uh, noteworthy that Colombia actually rather late started to sign bilateral invest investment uh, treaties and it has not many, only eight and the latest was just recently signed with Venezuela. Uh, and I think it actually already ended in force. There is 10 more that they signed, but that never entered into force. Uh, and eight bilateral investment agreements, if we look at other Latin American states, for example, Argentina has more than 50, is actually rather a small amount of number. They stopped kind of signing FTAs, well, with the exception of this recent one with Venezuela, and started then negotiating FTAs, so free trade agreements, with dedicated investment protection chapters, with, which include the ISDS uh, mechanism that Teresa just uh, presented. I don't think I have to explain again what it is, right? The special right of investors to sue states in case they pass a regulation investors are not happy with that might affect their business or whatnot. Um, so those FTA, those bits, uh, there's only two which are actually signed with European states, EU states, not European, because there's Great Britain and Switzerland also. And then the FTAs are mainly signed with uh, countries like Canada and the US. There's also FTAs with Great Britain and the EU, but they do not include ISDS. And Colombia, actually before the change of government, has shown interest in joining the CPTPP. So this, um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement without the US, which is why it changed a bit its name, and also the Energy Charter Treaty that Teresa just recently presented. So um, the new government actually, uh, Bajo Pedro, has shown a bit of a different approach to the whole um, trade and investment question. They were actually uh, asking the US government to renegotiate their uh, trade agreement because of the unfair terms, especially um, for milk producers or dairy producers, uh, which in Colombia uh, are losing a lot of market share due to the very um, cheap imports from the US, but also from the EU, actually. Um, yeah. Maybe let's uh, continue. So what are the consequences of having signed those bilateral investment agreements and uh, free trade agreements with investment protection chapters? Well, uh, the, when, uh, Colombia received its first ISDS claim in its history in 2016. And since then, it registered 21 until date, 21 ISDS claims. This is, if we look at the average uh, per year, actually a lot, a record, if you want, in Latin America. Even Argentina, which is the most sued country in Latin America and in, in the world, has not had such a bad average on, um, you know, every year, uh, like yearly average of, of receiving ISDS claims. And 
there is maybe no surprise that actually in 2018, Colombia was even the most sued country in the world with at least six ISDS claims, known ISDS claims, because this is only numbers we knew. There might actually also be more ISDS claims we don't know about. Colombia is the sixth most sued Latin American country under ISDS claims. And um, here you can see a little graph which is taken from our research, which shows how many um, claims Colombia has received so far and in which year. There has been one already in 2023. Actually, the second uh, claim of the year uh, went to Colombia. So yeah. But there might be more because there's also quite some threats. So um, companies threatening, announcing that they're going to sue Colombia for uh, different action. And one which I think is very relevant because it um, is linked to what we're going to talk or what we're talking about today is the, um, the law of uh, equality and social justice. So la ley de igualdad y justicia which Pedro presented and which aims to raise 4.4 billion US dollars uh, to invest in social spending by introducing an extra tax on revenues from oil and coal firms. And the representative of the US American firms active in the oil and coal sector in Colombia has already announced that if that um, law is actually passed, then they will present claims, ISDS claims. Uh, I, sorry, I just thought there was a question. Um, okay, consequences two. All of the claims against Colombia come from US, Canadian and European investors. None from other Latin American investors from China or whatnot, only US and European. Uh, with this latest claim in 23, actually the balance is even getting a bit more equal between US and Canadian, like North American investors and European ones. It's 53% for North American and 47% uh, percent of the investors that are presenting claims against Colombia are from Europe. Four claims are by Spanish investors none of which relates to the mining sector, three from Switzerland, all three from Glencore, and then three from Great Britain, one actually from Anglo-American, which uh, I will also enter a bit more in detail in a second. Almost 50% of all those ISDS claims against Colombia are related actually to the mining sector, so a lot. And this is a general tendency in Latin America. Let me just tell you a bit more about my <laughs> research. Uh, almost one fourth of all claims against Latin American states are actually related to the mining sector. Um, but Colombia, there is a very special uh, country with so many, uh, actually almost 50% of all its claims related to the sector. There are still 14 claims pending with a uh, worth at least 2.8 billion US dollars. There's one claim, like one very uh, important and expensive claim which is almost six uh, which is 60 16.5 billion us dollar but this one um according to official government sources uh has been discontinued but there is no official note of discontinu discontinuance which is why we we are still kind of like should we edit should we not edit should we edit what i left it out for now uh and of course there's also a lot of claims we don't know actually the worth of it. So it's at least 2.8, but actually it's more. And Glencore already won a claim against um, Colombia, one out of the three claims. And Colombia was ordered to pay 20 billion. Oh, that, that is wrong. It says, I don't know, I forgot the million, sorry. 20 million USD to Glen Glencore in its last claim. Let's go to what actually uh, Aldo was going to present you today, which is the claim, the latest claim by Glencore against Colombia, which is especially outrageous, if I might say so. What it is about? It is what is it about? It's about the largest open pit coal mine in Latin America, Cerejón, which is uh, situated in one of the poorest 
provinces, La Guajira in Colombia. It has been active for more than four decades, actually, and is owned by Glencore and was owned until recently by BHP and Anglo America. Oh, I forgot an end there. Sorry, I just made those slides up very quickly when I found out that I had to give that presentation. So Anglo American, which is a British um, mining firm. Um, what have been the consequences of those four decades of coal mining in this region? What we know of is that at least 44 local streams dried up because they used all the water. There has been displacement of at least 34 indigenous communities, environmental degrada degradation and contamination of water and soil affecting health and livelihoods of populations. And um, in fact, due to all those negative consequences and because of the because the affected communities present, presented a claim to suspend activities, especially in one part um, of La Guajira, where the mine was going to extend into, um, the Constitutional Court of Colombia ordered in 2017 to suspend the expansion of the mine towards this other stream, which is called uh, Arroyo, which is stream Bruno. Um, and in its decision, it's argued that the project threatens the fundamental rights to water, food, security, and health of the Wayu indigenous communities in this area in order to further environmental and social impact assessments. Then there was a going back and forth between um, agencies, between local communities, and so on and so forth. And because of all the activities and because their uh, action was suspended, their mining activities were suspended, Glencore and Anglo American presented uh, ISDS claims, two separate ones, in 2000 and May 2021. Anglo American then decided, after quite some outrage, that they, are, they were discontinuing the case. There is no open decision, uh, open explanation, though, on why they decided. And they also sold all its uh, their shares of the mine to Glencore. So now uh, Serejón is only in the hands of Glencore. And Glencore is still fighting to being able to continue with its... And um, since then, there have been there has been protest and a protest movement actually forming against Glencore. Mm, Aldo is actually part, and also uh, TNI is part of um, like an international yeah movement, international how you call them coalition that is forming against Glencore and activities specifically to that case. Um, and there has been an Amigos Curiae presented to the ISDS court, like the tribunal. So that is like a letter of the friends. Um, so people interested in the case presenting a letter saying that, um, you know, arguing um, that the government has to revise all its uh, bilateral investment agreements, its FTAs, et cetera, that allow for ISDS. And um, at the same time, government agencies actually conducted another so, uh, sustainable impact assessment and found that there, were no, there was no problem whatsoever with the activities. And now they want to trying to um, uh how would you say trying to kind of uh, restart the, the activities there and uh, to being able to dissuade the case and to to stop the case but that uh, so far hasn't happened so the case is still ongoing we don't know how much money glencore is asking for as indemnization and um yeah it's quite outrageous if you ask me and I know that Aldo would have been able to tell you a bit more because he is also more on the ground there and active. There has been um, a statement, a public statement that maybe uh, you have seen that you can still sign. I can also put that in the chat. 
where there's a bit more info on the this case. All right. Just a quick um, excourse to the EU Columbia FTA and what impact it has on uh, raw materials trade. Um, actually, I find, found it quite interesting that by 2013, when this FDA entered into force, 33% uh, of the export of Colombia's export to the EU were actually coal. Since then, that changed completely. Um, you can see here, this is actually um, a chart that I copied from the sustainable ex post sustainable impact assessment of the EU, which was conducted uh, just recently and its final report is from January 2022. And what we can see there is that coal actually lost a lot of market shares, if you want. Um, so it's not being the most exported product anymore to the EU, it's now bananas. And um, at the same time, anyway, gold, for example, went up quite a lot. And also other uh, agricultural products. So what we can see and what happened and what they're telling, at least the, FI, um, the exposed SIA is telling us, is that due to changing world market prices, Colombia is not exporting that much coal anymore. Although, of course, now with the geopolitical situation, with the war in Ukraine, this has changed. So there is more export again. But the prior years, um, actually, it went down incredibly. We have agricultural products being exported more and more from Colombia to the EU, with, with bananas uh, being the top um, selling product, but also avocados, which uh, started to be exported incredibly much. So now we have this kind of inverted uh, trade where you have 22% of exports in 20, uh, 2012 only were non-coal and non-hydrocarbon products. And by now it is 52% actually. Interestingly, what this SIA also found is that this did not have any, um, uh, or did not have much effect on the G the, the uh, oh, how you call them the emissions the CO2 emissions and other uh, GHG emissions in fact for all three countries so Ecuador Peru and Colombia and also for the EU because of the trade that changed and also because there's now more agricultural trade and more trade of course also apparently of products that are not very environmentally friendly and climate friendly um, CO2 emissions actually increased in those countries. I found that uh, rather interesting. And that also shows that actually those free trade agreements um, are not at all environmental or climate friendly, even if you have less uh, coal being exported to the EU. Yeah, so that may be as a quick... Um, X course. And one last thing I wanted to say, which I didn't manage to set up another slide, was that uh, because Teresa mentioned all those bilateral investment agreements um, that where you could, where investors can be suing uh, states if they, for example, want to face on coal or whatnot. It is not only the Energy Charter Treaty, but the EU, the EU countries have more than 1,100 of those bilateral investment uh, agreements in place and enforce that actually allow for uh, ISDS. And there's also new free trade agreements being signed. Well, one, uh, Germany just ratified it, with, which is CETA, which also has the ICS, now reformed ISDS mechanism in place. But there's the EU-Mexico and the EU-Chile agreement. We'll talk a bit about EU-Chile next week, um, which also allow for ICS, and there is, for now, no interpretive declaration or exclusion of, for example, fair and equitable treatment or clauses that are being used a lot to sue states, also in case, for example, they place to, uh, plan to phase out coal or take any other regulations. And I mean, we just saw the case of Colombia, actually, that is now a US-American 
investors uh, threatening to sue because of an extra tax on coal and uh, oil, uh, on the coal and oil sector, but that could also be uh, European investors uh, doing the same. And interestingly, to close the head of the US American firms in the oil and uh, um, coal sector in Colombia said, yeah, we all agree that we have to do something against climate change, but it doesn't have to be so quick. So that was his argument that just this tax revenue was just too quick and too much uh, for uh, investors to take. And I think that is, uh, yeah, shows us a bit also where things are leading and why we have to stop ISDS in all its forms in all agreements and uh, urge our governments to, to exit this very dangerous system. All right, that's it. Uh, I hope it was more or less clear. I still have a bit of questions according, uh, concerning the EU Colombia FTA. I just started doing a bit of research on that, but uh, if you have further questions, please uh, feel free.